Hey everybody, Josh here, welcome back to another video. Uh, the iPhone 14 Pro is Apple's latest smartphone, and while there are some similarities to last year's model, there's also some differences that make the 14 Pro pretty unique. So here's my one week review. So starting with the display, we still have a 6.1 inch display on the Pro model. It's still rocking that super beautiful OLED display. And of course it has Pro Motion. Now just to touch on Pro Motion a bit, I feel like this definitely is flying under the radar this year because it's not anything new, but ProMotion is by far the best thing that you can upgrade as far as your screen goes, because there's nothing like watching a buttery smooth animation on 120 Hertz display. I feel like that was a very nerdy thing to say, but 120 Hertz ProMotion display still got in the 14 Pro and it's amazing. The display this year is also brighter at 2000 nits. And when I was viewing it out in sunlight, it actually was noticeably brighter. It definitely will come in clutch if you're out and about doing some errands or out on a hike or at the beach. So yeah, brighter screen gets a thumbs up. Now something completely new this year is the always on display. So my experience with the always on display is at first when I unboxed the phone, I really wasn't too used to it. In fact, I was honestly a little bit annoyed that Apple didn't give us the option to have just a completely black screen with just a white text. So I ended up turning it off on the first day, but then the second day, I figured that since I'm a tech reviewer, I should probably give it another shot. And so I did, and to my surprise, I actually got pretty used to it and actually ended up enjoying it a lot. Now, I think the reason why I was a little bit annoyed the first few days was just the fact that it was too colorful and too distracting and too bright, which a lot of other reviewers have also expressed the same opinion. But the more I used it, the more I grew to like just having the time and the weather and my next event right there at a glance. And then if I have any new notifications, it also shows up on the bottom, which I also like. Now, I think the reason that Apple didn't want to give us an option to have just a black screen with white text is because they want to differentiate themselves from Android, right? Because Android has had this for years and that's sort of the look that we've come to expect from an always on display is just a black screen with white text. And so when Apple came to the game and implemented their always on display, that was probably just a low hanging fruit. So having a colorful display was a way that Apple was like, aha, we are different from Android and we can do it better. Now I actually had some friends with Android phones and I was able to put the always on display of the 14 Pro next to their phones. And to my surprise, the 14 Pro was not only easier to read in direct sunlight, it was just brighter and there was more information on the screen, which I really liked. So if you are getting a 14 Pro, I would suggest giving the always on display just a few days for your brain to adjust to it and your eyes to adjust to it because while it may be a little bit distracting at first, I think you will grow to like it and it's obviously got some functionality benefits as well. Now, a couple of quirks with the always on display. Let's say you have a timer running and there's a live application right there. If I turn the screen off, you'll see that the seconds actually go away for some reason, even though the refresh rate is one hertz, which is once per second. Now, as the timer counts down past one minute, you'll see the seconds come back and yeah, just a little bit quirky. Now the always on display also adapts to certain apps that you have open. So for example, if you're using the remote app to control your Apple TV, when you lock the phone, the remote actually stays on the screen. The same thing also goes with Apple Maps. If you're using that for navigation, when you lock the phone, you'll have the next direction up on top, which is also pretty nice. Okay, next up, let's talk about the dynamic island. I feel like a lot of people are hating on the name itself, which I don't really understand because I feel like it's a pretty fun name and it kind of describes what it does. By now, I'm sure you already know what dynamic island is, but for those who don't, it is an area of the screen up top where the notch used to be. And this area of the screen houses the front selfie camera as well as the dot projector for face ID. Now, the fun thing about the dynamic island is that it's dynamic. So when you close certain apps like Spotify that I have here, it goes up to the top and you get access to some quick controls and if you tap, it actually takes you to the app itself. This area is also great for displaying notifications. So let's say you toggle your phone to silent, you'll see a little pop-up there, animate from the center. And that'll also show up when you're charging your phone or when you're using Face ID, it'll actually have a bigger pop-up. I found those things to be quite nice. It makes the phone feel a little more polished and more fluid and fun to use and honestly gives it a little bit of character. But for multitasking, I really didn't find myself using it all that much over the past week. In fact, the only times that I actually remember using Dynamic Island was to show friends the Dynamic Island because they would come up to me and ask to see it because I always have the newest phone. 
Now that's not to say that the dynamic island isn't great for multitasking. I think it could be, for example, if you have a recipe pulled up on your phone and you need to set a timer for maybe the oven or your pasta. In that use case, the dynamic island would allow you to have the recipe up and also let you keep an eye on the timer right up at the top. I just think that there needs to be some time for the software to catch up to fully utilize that space in order for us to really appreciate it. Now, one thing I was curious about was if the dynamic island would get in the way of content. Now I'd say for regular, 16 by nine content, it's really not a problem. As you guys can see, the dynamic island is completely out of the way. But when you jump to two to one content, which some creators are uploading now, including MKBHD, you'll see that the dynamic island sort of eats away at the edge of the frame. Now, how does this compare to the 13 Pro's notch? Well, here's 16 by nine. As you guys can see, the notch is completely out of the way. And then with two to one content, the notch is just ever so slightly on the edge right there. And I believe if it's on YouTube, it actually pokes into the frame just maybe like one pixel-ish. So definitely not as bad as the 14 Pro, but yeah, there you go. So the 14 Pro has three cameras, which are largely the same as the 13 Pro. So some of the major differences, of course, the main camera has a 48 megapixel sensor this year. 48 megapixels allows you to capture a lot more details, which makes it great for cropping into certain photos. And you do have to be in the raw shooting mode, which means that the photos aren't gonna be taken as fast. So you can't really spam the shutter button. The photos are also gonna be absolutely humongous at about 75 megabytes per photo. When you compare that to the one to three megabytes of the JPEGs, it really puts things in perspective. I've definitely been really impressed with the raw photo capability on the iPhone 14 Pro. I think the detail that you get really does rival some DSLR cameras in my opinion. And I'm definitely gonna be taking more raw photos this year with the iPhone 14 Pro. Now, unfortunately that 48 megapixel sensor is really all that the 14 Pro has going for it because here's where things start to change. So as you may have already heard, the 14 Pro definitely has an over sharpening problem. Problem. And this becomes pretty clear when you look at some side-by-side -side images from the 13 Pro to the 14 Pro. Hopefully you can tell the difference, but if I just zoom into the highlights, you can see how much more unnatural the 14 Pro looks. I've also noticed that the main lens is actually slightly less sharp at the edges of the frame. So that's definitely a defect in the lens itself. And that's not just me that's experiencing this, but there's a couple of other reviewers who have done pretty extensive camera tests that are also experiencing the same thing that I'm experiencing. And then of course we have to talk about low light photography because Apple has made some really bold claims this year with two to three times improvement in low light. And so when I looked at the images coming from the 14 Pro, it almost seemed like it had some sort of smoothing or noise reduction filter applied to it. Now, in some cases, it was actually better in low light, but then in other cases, I felt like the 13 Pro was actually sharper. So it's really hard to say. I feel like it's kind of a toss up between which one is actually better. Now, one thing that Apple has improved this year is dynamic range. So that seems to be a lot better on the 14 Pro. You can sort of make out the details of the clouds a little bit better in this photo, but for some reason, the 14 Pro's photo also has a weird bluish greenish hue on it. And I actually prefer the 13 Pro's photo in this scenario. Now with the selfie cam, again, it's the same story. It's sort of a toss up. Sometimes the contrast just looks really overbearing and the sharpening just looks pretty insane. And then other times it looks pretty good. So definitely some inconsistencies here with the photography. What I do really appreciate is of course the auto focusing front camera. That's a feature where if you're using your phone as a mirror, for example, to check if you have something stuck in your teeth, it's a lot easier to make out the details. And of course you can take some really up close selfies, which are actually pretty gross. So overall, I'd say aside from the 48 megapixel raw photos that you're gonna be able to get with the 14 Pro, it's not really that much of a difference from the 13 Pro and in some cases might be even worse. Now in video land, of course, we're getting a brand new mode, which is action mode, where essentially it's cropping into the sensor to give you an ultra stabilized image while sacrificing a little bit on image quality. All right, we're doing a quick test of action mode. You got Cameron here? Keep going, keep going, keep going. Now I'd say unless you're fully sprinting and also filming at the same time, for 99% of your videos, you're definitely gonna wanna stay with regular video, but action mode was pretty impressive nonetheless. Now in cinematic mode, we also get the upped resolution from 1080p to 4K. Now in my entire year of owning the 13 Pro, I haven't really touched cinematic mode even once, but now with the upgraded 4K resolution, it actually looks pretty good. 
maybe I might start using it, who knows? Now, talking through some of the more minor changes this year, like battery life and the A16 Bionic chip. As far as battery life goes, I feel like the always on display doesn't really impact battery life all that much. I was getting about the same usage when compared to my 13 Pro, which is just about 70% every day, so ending the day with 30%. So it's definitely a really, really good battery life. I'd say if you are a medium to light user, you can definitely expect an all day battery out of this phone. And then as far as the A16 Bionic chip, I really didn't notice any difference from my 13 Pro. It's just as snappy and just as fast. I guess if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Smartphone technology, I'd say it has become pretty mature now, which means for companies like Apple, it becomes pretty hard to come out with a new feature every year to wow us. Now, that may seem like a downside, at least for us tech enthusiasts, but the upside for that is for most consumers, they now don't have to feel like their two-year-old iPhone is just an old brick. Now, if you are thinking of upgrading this year, here's my advice. First of all, ProMotion is definitely the most underrated feature this year, in my opinion. Now, in an experiment I did last year, I found out that even though most people won't notice ProMotion immediately, it's when they go back to a regular 60 hertz display that they start to notice the stuttering. So I think ProMotion is a great feature and should definitely be added to your list of reasons to upgrade. Now, the other new features like the always on display, the 48 megapixel photography and the dynamic island aren't really reasons on their own to upgrade. However, with the great battery life, the amazing A16 Bionic chip and just the entire package, it may be a good reason to upgrade if you have an older phone and you wanna treat yourself this year or if you can find a used iPhone 13 Pro, that is also a really great choice. All right, thanks for watching till the end, guys. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you wanna see more tech content and leave a comment down below. Let me know your thoughts on the 14 Pro, about the camera test that I did, about smartphones in general, and what features you'd like to see in the next iPhone. All right, I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.